Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Hope Initiative. Today we're having a special episode dedicated to Mr. Nikolai Fakustin. My name is Aaron Yu and I'm going to be interviewing our performers for his Opus 41 variation. A little bit of a background on Kapustin. He was a Russian pianist and composer born in 1937. He was around 83 years old when he sadly died on July 2nd of this year. The Hope community felt the need to honor and spotlight his music in remembrance of him. He was famous for combining jazz and classical forms, and while his music sounded much like jazz music, he actually considered himself a composer. Some of his famous works include his concert studies, etudes, and this variation. Today, we'll be having four performers playing this variation. Variation Opus 41 was written in 1984 when he was around 47 in the same year when he wrote his concert etudes, which are another famous piece of his. It's an original in a theme in variation form with six variations on the theme, and although it is different from most classical variations. So without taking anything further away from our performers, let's give them a warm welcome. Hi, I'm Angela, and I am a rising senior in Plano, Texas. I've been studying piano for 11 years. I currently study with Yifan Liu. And aside from practicing piano, I also own a lot of plants. That's my number one thing I've been doing during quarantine. <laughs> Hi, my name is Justin Wabi. I'm currently a incoming senior. I'm 16 years old, and I currently study under Dr. Nasi Fugasawa, as well as Dr. John McCarthy at the SF Conservatory of Music Pre-College. And other than music, I love watching a lot of the films, especially um, comedy and horror films, sometimes a fusion of both. My name is Esther Pham. I am 16 years old and I am going to be a junior in high school. I live in Garland, Texas, and I study under Dr. Thomas Ingar. Um, the things I like to do would be reading classical literature like Jane Austen, Edgar Allan Poe. And if I'm not reading, I guess, I, I write um, novels, romance mostly, but these days I'm writing a detective story about homeschool kids because I'm homeschooled and more comfortable writing about homeschool kids. Thank you everyone for the introduction. So how has quarantine or this pandemic affected your lives, both music related and not music related? So I think quarantine has definitely tampered with my sense of a daily routine quite a bit because like without that especially when there was still school like without that sense of like eight hours of school every day um, I think my scheduling has has been very whack in general it's kind of all over the place but it's also given me a lot more time to practice and also just immerse myself in various music projects and yeah like for example hope like I definitely wouldn't have been able to spend much time on this like project if not for quarantine so I am, like I said before, I'm homeschooled. So there's not, not really any difference in my schedule. Everything's stable, no disruption. But I guess I could say I'm, I've been more active than usual. Sometimes I would go out and play with my sister playing volleyball and I would work out a couple times a week. Do you guys have a favorite composer or a time period to play from? Honestly, I, I feel like I'm very not picky about music. Like, I generally just like anything that people <laughs> play at me with some, with like a few exceptions, of course. I guess some composers that I feel most comfortable playing, like maybe I like feel am easier to express with are probably Schumann, Bach, and I love, I love Tchaikovsky, but I listen to his symphonic works a lot more than piano. And of course, Beethoven. <laughs> um, there's a composer that I recently just um, discovered his works and uh, this is quite recent but over time I've started to like develop a love for um, what he writes. His name is um, Justin Wabi. Like his writing is just so... <laughs> joking. I do compose on the side though but in all seriousness. I, I've started to, I would say in terms of periods, I've started to um, develop a better appreciation for the 20th century period. Um, over time, I, um, I used to really like Baroque music when I was really young, but then um, over time, of course, I started to um, deal more into 20th century repertoire and more into even like Capucin's writing and John Cage and um, 
um, Del Tridici, if I'm not too sure if you guys know, but a lot of the modern works I feel have really been like emerging in terms of my repertoire as well as my interests and even jazz as well. Do you want to elaborate more on your composing? Because like you seem to be really like into it. With my composing, I took a couple classes at the conservatory. I was used to usually writing solo piano, um, trios, um, um, also also duos with piano and other instrument, and even like one like symphonic work. But then over time, after I stopped um, at the conservatory, classes finished for me like during the summer. I'm part of my school's choir, and I also know a lot of singers. So my style of writing emerged from classical, very um, textbook methods into more of like pop musical theatery like, which is quite a deviation because in the morning and afternoon, let's say I play like some really intense Scriabin or Tchaikovsky. And then in the evening, I end up composing some like pop song for a, for a friend that requested something that I write for her. So it's, it's stuff like that, which is very strange, but I think is quite nice like to broaden my musical sense. So I, I, I mostly compose more modern stuff than before. So my favorite composer is definitely Capucin because I love jazzy style pieces. Uh, I'm learning some jazz pieces like jazz interpretation and uh, I find them to be really fun to play. So Capucin is my number one favorite composer. All right so that kind of brings us to the next question of do you guys play or have you played jazz before? Not like jazz in its truest form. Uh, someday I will learn how to improvise that like like actual jazz pianists amaze me so much. I've played uh, Schoenfield's Cafe Music. It's a the piano trio which is I guess my closest thing to having that swing that I'll ever get to. Personally for me I've actually played quite a bit of jazz in terms of solo piano and also um, um, chair music. I, well, before Capustin, I actually um, learned um, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue um, for piano, solo actually. And then I also played a, um, a, a Capustin piece actually, it was a um, duo for two pianos. I think it was um, duet inspired from Dizzy Gillespie's like, um, it's a very, um, it's not a very well-known piece. However, it's one of Capustin's, I would say, um, rare gems that I think more people should listen to. So I've been learning jazz for at least a year already. And I've taken lessons with professors, but recently I stopped because of some personal reasons. But I'm still playing jazz from the real book. I would play some couple of interpretation, like all the things you are. I, I just love that. Um, song and uh, aside from that I uh, sometimes I would try to compose some jazz too though they're not really great be because I'm not um, really into comp composing pieces but I'm trying to practice every day write at least a short music so that I could improve. Well there's one thing about composing I think composing in itself is is quite easy in my opinion mm -hmm. but writing it down on paper and truly formulating your ideas is a pain in the ass that's true i i don't like it i feel like i'm writing the piano and i'm like oh my god this could be like a hit and then i go on like sibelius which i i um, which i notate down on the computer and i'm like oh my god this is really trash i feel that like every day i was like writing and i realized that i couldn't transfer my piano playing to the paper so it was really difficult as there was i have like mad respect for everyone right here because like i cannot compose or jazz so like kudos to all if of you, you who can do that if you put your mind to it i'm sure you can create something nice mm. how did y'all get into this composition piece i actually picked this piece up or specifically the variation that i am playing i picked it up two and a half days ago. <laughs> um, basically, uh, I literally just started learning this piece because of the Hope Project as like a tribute to Kapustin because like I love his etudes, concert etudes and sonatas and like I, I actually never listened to his Opus 41 before 
this project started, but I listened to it and I just really, really liked it. I had finished a 20th century piece with my piano teacher and she said, why don't you learn a different one? And I was like, okay, cool. So I wanted to learn something kind of like, um, kind of in Capuchin style. So I was looking at this concert A2. It's none of them really like struck to me. And then I saw an album with, um, it was like Capuchin plays Capuchin, right? And then I saw his variations and I was like, oh, this is weird. And I clicked on it and I listened to it through and I was like, this is an amazing piece, wow. And then I asked uh, my teacher if I could, and she was like, you know, it'd be a challenge, but sure, why not? I discovered Capuchin's variation a week after I discovered Capuchin's existence. So I was just listening to Capuchin's pieces. I was obsessed at that time. I listened to all of his concert, A2 Conchero's, uh, all of his short pieces. And then I realized that his, vari his variation was part of his album. So I opened it and I loved it right on the first listen. And I was, I wanted to play it. I was, I felt like I found a gemstone, I guess. and. I knew I had to play this piece. It's too good. So I played it and it's worth it. I'm so happy that I found it. What are some technical challenges in this particular piece? This technical challenge, I never quite realized till about my like fourth performance of the piece. I remember um, playing the piece um, during, I think, John Perry Academy during its um, beginning concert. And I remember like, all of the professors like saying good job and complimenting me. And there was this one professor that complimented all the other performers except me. And then I was like, okay, something must be up because he's a really nice guy. And, and he saw, I, I knew he saw me like three times. I had a lesson with him in, in, the, in the academy, right? And then well, he was like, you know, let's look at your variations real quick. And I was like, oh, yep, here we go. And he was like, you know, you play well, However, there really isn't a sense of downbeat and pulse. And then I was thinking, well, it's kind of written like in a improvisatory manner. And he was like, yes, it is. However, it's not really a jazz piece with structure if you don't give a rhythmic downbeat. So from there, I recorded myself and I was like, oh, shoot, that's true. It really sounds like just like a flowy, dazzling piece of nonsense the way I played it. So in essence, if I, the one thing will challenge you have to pinpoint is just accenting downbeat and actually making sure that everything is consolidated and take liberties here and there, but you still have to make sure that there is a sense of pulse. The fourth, fifth, and sixth variation is the hardest, are the hardest of the whole composition because the fourth variation is, even though it's slow, you have to play it as melodic as you can and you have to make sure you don't miss a note what type of emotions or imagery do you feel when you're playing these variations? Aside from um, just agitating the last variation, I would say the one word that truly describes the whole entire piece would be groovy. Because honestly, and that could be said for jazz in itself, but in terms of this variation through every single line and every single measure, every single page, I would say to have a sense of pulse, to have a sense of just meshing in all these 16ths with a set of like five 16 30 second notes, mesh, like meshing all of that together and then making it sound like such a, a jazzy masterpiece as it is, then you really have to have like a sense of like grooviness and that you honestly are doing it effortlessly. So for my variation specifically, which is the fourth one, the like slower one, this is probably shaped by just my I guess stereotypical vision of how I perceive jazz music in general but I usually think of like performance in like some sort of like public space right so when I listen to the fourth variation and when I play it in context of the larger piece I kind of think of it as a moment where the performer the pianist kind of steps aside from the normal like groovy like jazzy stuff that you play for like whatever patrons, whatever audience every night. And it becomes a little bit more like singing, more melancholic even, and kind of just like, it's a rare moment where the performer gets to like express his like non, non like showy feelings a little bit more. And then it goes boom, right back to the presto and then it's all gone. But there, it's just that like fleeting moment. 
What do you think is special about like variation in comparison to his other works or other 20th century works? Well, the 20th century works I am most familiar with in terms of like piano works are definitely like Prokofiev's and all this. And aside from it just being like a totally different style in terms of being like more jazz inspired and more like improvisatory compared to Prokofiev, which is definitely not. Um, I think a very big difference that I see is kind of both of them are very rhythmic at times, but I think the way they utilize rhythm is very different in that Kapustin kind of uses it as a way to like spice things up and kind of as like a, like almost like a surprise, but not in like a bam in your face, like harsh surprise, right? It's just like very like something you can dance to, something that makes you feel very lighthearted and like groovy as Justin put it. Whereas I think a lot of 20th century music, when they use the percussiveness and the rhythmic uh, elements in their music, it's more for a sense of like a very strong beat, a very like militaristic, like even like just battle like uh, aura instead of just this lightheartedness that Kabusin brings, at least in this variation, in this set of variations. Um, well, personally, I believe that um, this variation or this set of variations is quite special. It's um, very, very different than a lot of Kapustin's works because first of all, this showcases like six, seven ideas, different emotions, different moods, different um, motifs, different progressions. Whereas his other works more famously, his eight concert attitudes, they only showcase like I would say one style in each one, like in regards to his intermezzo, his pastoral, which is ridiculously overplayed, and his um, more. But uh, don't get me wrong, pastoral is a great piece. But in this, it covers so much that it's just a blending of so much different aspects of jazz pulled into one. And in addition, this Kapustin's writing in general, in terms of jazz, is quite different in terms of American jazz, like Gershwin or Duke Ellington, or like more like just more jazz composers from the like United States or even different countries as well. Not only because this is Russian jazz, but it's more that he combines classical idioms as well as jazz motifs. So in that sense, it's not like boom jazz in your face, like how Gershon writes it with his like, like big fancy brass and then all this. But Kapustin's more subtle yet can be in your face at the same time, but it's in more of a, I would say a smooth texture. Like it blends a bit more cohesively. And then when you like, it, it just flows so nice. Like in the beginning, it's kind of like very groovy. And then when it comes to the second and third variation, it's very, very like, here's a melody. Here's what I'm trying to convey. Here's like the overall jazz atmosphere that I'm trying to give off. So it's very, it's very um calculated like the way he writes like inspired from classicism as well as jazz it's very very like methodical so, so i find the uh, capuchin's variation quite interesting because his variations are based on stravinsky's right of spring it's the theme is the introduction of the Stravinsky Rite of Spring. And uh, I find, how, find it funny how he used um, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring introduction because people back then, when they first listened to Stravinsky's Rite of Spring in the first time, it, for, when it was performing for the first time, everyone got, got mad and start throwing punches at each other. So I guess Kapustin is trying to use this theme, the introduction, and make a variation over it. So I guess this variation is like, the variations are kind of crazy, I guess. He's trying to make it crazy because that's what the Rive Spring is. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know how well that picked, the audio picked up, but it picked up well. <laughs> yeah, I definitely like that immediately. And wow, this is like really interesting that he like modeled it off of the. My instinct was to say that Kapustin 
was like, oh, it'd be hella cool to write a composition out of, write a string, right? And he writes the first motif. It's like, wow, this is, this is actually really good. This could be a hit. And then the second page, he's like, I have my own ideas. And he just writes just his own jazzy thing. Just keeps on writing, keeps on writing. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pages. And then when he finally gets the slow section, he's like, oh my God, I've written 15 pages of my own jazz music. Where the heck's right of spring? And he was like, oh, what if I just like put an Easter egg in the, the slow section and um and it sounds very like right of spring and then the end he's like oh let me just make it die away like right of spring <laughs> but then he was like no it's such a great work let me just get a really bombastic ending and just makes that and then the final ba -bum. that's i think the last chord in right of spring whatever it is but everything that i said is false because to really understand the depictions of Rite of Spring and this work, you really have to listen to f the full Rite of Spring, which, which I've not. And then after that, have the score in front of you, and then also have the score of the variations. And then each variation, try to find the specific point in Rite of Spring, the whole entire work that matches. That sounds that, like hard work, for yeah, sure. That's why I did. So, someone's probably done their thesis on this. <laughs> Um, so if you could tell or ask Houston one thing, what would it be and like, why? I know I'd ask him. Personally, I think jazz is one of the hardest types of music to write. Thinking of all the chords, all the chord progressions, like for pop, it's so easy. One, four, five, one. One, five, six, three. One, three, six, seven. Okay, now I'm just making up chord progressions, but it's so easy like that. But with jazz, it's like one, then you have like the, the um, you have like nine, like ninth chords, and mm -hmm. then like 11th, 13th, and all of that. It's, it's almost like 12 tone even. Well, it's not really 12 tone, but it's, it's so complex with all the complex harmonies and like the rhythmic structures. That if I had to ask a question to Capucin, it'd be, what's, what goes through your mind when you like, try to write a jazz composition with any composer in general i just like have a burning desire to understand their like everything from the inspiration to like how their psyche works throughout the entire composing process and i just think it's probably difficult to convey the like musical genius in their brains to you in words but i would want to learn as much as possible and just let, let him talk <laughs> for as long as possible it's pretty amazing how like people to bring so many people together. This sounds so cliche, but it's honestly true, right? Like from the Hope Project to just like music in general, and um, like obviously at the heart of that for us classical pianists is these composers that put out these like beautiful works and amazing works, masterpieces for us to perform. And I just hope that our performances will do justice and honor Kafustin because yeah. I Rest in peace, Capuce. You know, we, we miss you. you. You died a bit too early. You know, I was really proud that I was playing something of a composer that was alive. But, you know, we hope that you, your legacy lives on for generations and generations to come. So, Thank you all for your time and your answers. And I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it. I definitely have. And we hope you enjoy these performers' rendition of Houston's Variation Opus 41.